I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This interview features two guests instead of the usual one and those guests are Lottie and Connor, founders of Earthly Biochar. Maybe you already use biochar in the garden. Maybe you've heard of it but aren't quite sure what it does or how it works or maybe you're completely new to it as a concept. In any case, I'm sure you'll learn such a lot from this interview. The interview starts with Connor describing the beginnings of his and Lottie's journey into biochar. We were quite concerned about climate change and we wanted a way to use our entrepreneurial spirit to do something about it. So we just, we found out about biochar through chance, really. And we were sort of blown away by what it could do for the climate and how effective it can be for soil health. So the story goes, um, I was studying a product design degree and I needed a final year project to do. And I wanted something that had, had an impact on, on the environment. So when I was looking around for ideas, I met a guy who was studying biochar at a permaculture society, and he wanted a way of making it himself at home. But he didn't know how to build a kiln. He didn't really have the tools or the skills necessary to do it. And after I told him I was doing product design, he asked me to look into it for him. Um, at the time, I hadn't heard of biochar, so I wasn't immediately interested in it. But when I pretty much had no product ideas, I just Googled what biochar was. And I found a TED talk on it and I found out it was carbon negative. So it could sequester carbon and help with taking it out of the atmosphere. And it was this amazing soil enhancer. Um, So I typed in biochar kiln for sale and nothing came up. So the next morning I went down to my lecture and I said, oh, I've got this biochar thing. I don't really know much about it. And, you know, I'm not sure if it's going to work. And she was like, yeah, yeah, do that one. Um, No one's done anything like that before. So I was pretty terrified, but nine months later, messing around with sort of bean cans and oil drums and making prototypes, I designed a, a back garden biochar maker. Um, and we have to do uh, an exhibition to the public uh, at the end of our degree show. And when I was showing it to people, ended up getting 15 people to sign up to buy it. And at that stage, we thought, OK, maybe this is the climate friendly business idea we were looking for. Um, so one of our lecturers came up to me and said, oh, your project's really interesting. Uh, can we co-author a research paper on it? And to do that, we needed to do a grow test. So we were going to have like 20 radishes on a windowsill. I needed to source some compost. So I was ringing up local plant nurseries, trying to get hold of some free, good quality compost. And on the fourth one, I rang up, uh, Kings Park Nursery in Bournemouth um, and uh, the nursery manager called Chris Evans he picked up and he said oh what do you need this compost for then and I said oh I'm doing this trial on biochar have you heard of it and he hadn't heard of it but he invited me around Um, I told him about it showed him my kiln and he said right I'll run your grow test for you but instead of 20 plants we'll do it on 400 plants and he'll pay for and manage everything so that was an amazing unexpected outcome we ended up testing uh we i made the biochar in my prototype that i designed i charged it up with a compost tea and drove down to bournemouth and we mixed it into their compost which they just buy in 70 liter bags at a rate of 10 percent by volume and we potted up 400 plants uh three different types just bedding plants wallflower daisies uh can't remember the other one um and went home and then came back in three weeks time just to see if there had been any effect. And I, like, totally honest, I was quite scared. I was like, have I just introduced lots of diseases in his greenhouse? Uh, Is is this going to ruin his plants? But when I got there, it was visibly different and he was extremely impressed. And he said, roughly, we sped up the plants by about a week. So after that successful grow test, we did another one, but on 4,000 plants. And then we planted them into bedding, uh, into actual beds in Bournemouth Lower Gardens. Um, And when that one went really well as as well, he asked us to supply him with a yearly supply. Um, So when we tried to find that, 
we realized that no one was making it out of local uh, resources at the price and the quality and the sustainability criteria that we needed. So we needed to be certain that it was carbon negative made out of waste resources. So we went chopping down a forest to make it and made in a process which doesn't produce smoke. Um, and when we found that gap, we realized that if we wanted biochar to come to realization and actually have the impact we wanted it to have, we would have to set up the UK's production infrastructure. So we never intended to do that. To be honest, we didn't want to do that because it was quite a scary idea having you know machinery and land. But as we got more and more concerned about climate change, we just decided we were going to commit it. So um, yeah, I, I'll let Lottie describe what happened after that. Okay, cool. So I think um, that was about a year ago when we decided that we were going to set up the UK's um, biotoff production infrastructure. Um, and we also started getting more inquiries for ready-made biochar. Um, and we won a place on an accelerator program up in London. And that gave us a small cash injection into our startup of about £5,000 um, and enabled us to finalise the kiln prototypes. Um, and that's now live. And, and um, also it enabled us to kind of delve a bit deeper into what could the UK's production infrastructure look like. And through reaching out to people, we met an amazing professor at Reading University. And um, that relationship has now evolved to, to me doing a PhD with him um, on biochar, working with farms across the country to actually kind of start quantifying the real impacts that biochar can have both economically and environmentally on farming businesses in the UK. So, f yeah, fast forward a year, um, we're at a point where we're, making and selling biochar um, on a small scale and we also sell our kilns and I'm doing a PhD and working with lots of farms. Cool um, well there's quite a lot in that that I'm, I've got questions about so the first one was that you mentioned Connor that you charge it up with compost tea what does that mm. involve and why is that important? So biochar is like a battery um, you need to load it up with nutrients before you add it to soil so if you're if we were doing this grow test and we added uncharged, we call it raw biochar, into the potting mix, there was a chance that it would absorb nutrients and water from the compost as kind of stealing it from the plants. And this would negatively impact, could negatively impact the plant's growth until the battery was charged, so the biochar was charged. So there are so many different ways to charge biochar, but because we needed to do it in a rapid turnaround, we took uh, finished compost from... Uh, a local gardener who makes really good organic compost. We added it to rainwater. We put a bit of uh, molasses, so sort of unrefined sugar, in the container. And we bought some aquarium air pumps and we bubbled this mixture up, which kind of strange. Um, and what this did is it took the microbes in the compost, we fed them sugar, so that's one bit of their food, and then we fed them oxygen and we basically just multiplied them. And then once we had a good compost tea, you can tell it's good by the sort of frothiness, uh, the sort of foam on the top. Um, we steeped our biochar in that, like a tea bag sort of thing. Um, and then all of those nutrients and bacteria became absorbed into that. Um, and we soaked that in there for about six or seven hours. And then we drained it, drained as much of the liquid as we can, uh, and then took that to the, the plant nursery where we mixed it into compost. Mm -hmm. And would it matter if what you, you were using as the compost tea is the source of the, uh, well, as a green material? Because I'm thinking, obviously, you trialled it by the sounds of it on bedding plants. Um, I wondered what the effects were if you put it on leafy crops and whether it mattered, for example, if you used a comfrey tea or a nettle tea um, and the effect that had on particular types of plants. Yeah, so the main thing is, is that you just charge it up with um, nutrients, so uh, depending on obviously what the plant needs um, and then also just inhabiting, putting bacteria, so fungus and and, and uh, other bacteria in there. So um, one, what we do now is is instead of doing a compost tea, which kind of it takes a bit of time, we actually buy a, a powder which is used in hydroponics and that has suspended uh, 12 different types of bacteria and mycorrhizal in it with some other trace elements. And when we add that to water, those microbes sort of reanimate um, and then we then 
add some uh, liquid seaweed into that and then soak our biojar into that. So we'll just put that in a watering can and then pour that over the biojar in a bucket. Just mix that up. We don't even soak it for that long. And then we'll then mix that into compost. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add on different plants requiring different things. I think um, if you are planting with specific plants, like Connor said, just bear in mind of what, what you're actually going to be growing using the biochar. Um, so if you've got a plant that needs a lot of nitrogen, um, then make sure the compost tea that you're soaking your biochar in has the correct kind of NPK ratios for that plant. But um, other than that, I haven't actually heard of any specific um, requirements for, I think the only thing, because biochar is made from wood it has a really amazing porous structure which is why it acts like this sponge in the soil um, there is one requirement if you're planting larger um, species so if you're planting trees you want your biochar to be slightly larger just because the roots are larger but other than that there aren't really any kind of specific um, requirements for the different plants that you're planting with Mm -hmm. so so you provide the biochar or facilitate people making it themselves and then they do the compost tea process Yes, and when we um, sell our biochar, we sell the powder with it. So you can make up the microbial solution at home because lots of people don't always have access to that kind of product. So we have that. Um, that just comes with the biochar as standard. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, did your plant trials, obviously you, anecdotally, uh, they were about a week further advanced than they would have been had the biochar not been used. Have you done um, trials to see that in a kind of controlled setting or is that part of your PhD, Lottie? That's definitely part of the PhD. Um, the, the nursery trials on those 4,000 plants, um, that was a, I would say semi-controlled environment. Um, it was in large um, glass houses at a nursery and they had the same watering and feeding patterns on both the um, controls and the tests. And we took lots of photographs of the differences in root development as well as above ground growth and flowering. Um, but there wasn't any more kind of lab analysis done after that. So that's why I'm doing the PhD, because I want to look at the increase in biodiversity and microbial populations in the soil as a result of using biochar and also quantify what happens if we re deliberately reduce watering and fertilizer in plants with biochar. And if that sponge effect can still improve the plant's growth, even though we're giving them less resources. And that kind of study has been done before. There's a lot of literature out there which suggests that in good quality soil, you can see an increase of about 12% in yield with a reduction in water and feed. But I want to quantify that myself in the UK using um, plants that we grow here because a lot of the research has been done in tropical soils, hence why I'm doing this PhD. Mm, fascinating stuff. So you said about the when you make it, you ensure it's made responsibly and it's made with waste resources. What are waste resources? So the UK, in order for it to be uh, carbon negative, you've got to think about. Uh, so there are in the UK, there's between five and ten million tons of waste wood being generated each year, and you sort of think of this as a ticking carbon time bomb. Um, most of the time, this wood will end up in landfill or incineration. Uh, in landfill, methane is produced as well as CO2, and methane is 25 times worse as a greenhouse gas than CO2. And then in um, incineration, obviously, the carbon goes back into the air. So that's why we want to use waste. So we intercept that carbon before it has a chance to go back into the atmosphere by turning it into biochar. There is um, an argument for, so there are people in America who are you, using uh, free farmland sort of things that they're that doesn't compete for, for food crops and they're growing things like willow um, and they're coppicing it so they'll plant fields of willow they'll let it grow to a certain height and they'll cut it and then they'll turn that into biochar so it's sort of like farming carbon from the sky so at the moment we want to make use of clean untreated wood waste so stuff from uh, furniture factories uh, untreated pallets um, construction demolition waste, um, things from woodland management. So as we're going and thinning some trees, promoting biodiversity and uh, supporting the ecology in woodlands, there's a lot of biomass that's generated from that, as well as tree surgeons. So once, yeah, we're, we're focusing on waste at the moment because it's a problem. Um, but in the future, we probably could see um, carbon farming similar to the what I described with willow. Yeah. 
So when you sent me some information about what you do and your products and all the rest of it, you also sent me some really interesting stuff about how historically biochar has been used, particularly in other countries. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so you had a Craig Sams on your show, uh, I think a year ago now, and he did a really good job of talking about how biochar was sort of discovered, um, talking about terra preta and the link between the Amazon rainforest. So if any of your listeners want to go back and check that, um, I won't, I won't cover that, but things that, um, we can add to are, so the Japanese have a really interesting relationship with charcoal. Um, they have multiple different uses for it. So when they build a house, they will underneath the floorboards, they will put sacks of charcoal underneath it. And what that does is that it's pretty much like a dehumidifier. So as there's too much moisture in the air, the charcoal will absorb that moisture, similar to what it happens in soil. And then when the, so that uh, prevents damp and mold. And then when the air is dry, it will give it back again. So it's a really cool low tech way of regulating humidity. Um, another thing they do is they also um, make into charcoal sort of long branches and then they'll stick them in the corners of some of their rooms as a form of decoration, but it also passively filters the air. Uh, another thing they do is uh, you, you'll see some water bottles now with charcoal sticks in them. So they'll have a jug of tail water and they'll uh, stick a, a lump of charcoal in there, um, which will remove some of the impurities from the water. Another thing they do is they put the charcoal in breathable sacks and they'll put that in their fridges, in their veg drawers, and that will absorb some of the um, ethylene gas, which will slow down ripening and increase shelf life of food. Um, I haven't personally tried the fridge experiment yet, but it's something that I'm really interested in. Um, yeah, and throughout time, there are still rural Japanese cultures who will use charcoal, biochar, in in their um, food production. So there's a couple of videos on YouTube, but it's very hard to actually find good quality data. But you can see them sprinkling charcoal in ditches before, and then they'll cover those ditches with soil. Um, so they've been using it for thousands of years and, and we sort of, we forgot about it as a society and now it's being rediscovered. Um, some people call it the oldest thing that you've never heard of. So, yeah. Yeah. And what's happening in Sweden? I gather they're into it in a big way. Yeah. So Stockholm um, have done something interesting. So they won a million dollar grant by the Bloomberg Philanthropies in 2014 to set up a biochar production infrastructure there. So they've bought a, a kiln called a Pyreg, which is a German manufacturer who we're now talking to. And what that does is the citizens and the tree um, utilities there, they will give their garden waste. Um, they dry that, chip it up, and then put it into their biochar machine. That will then produce biochar. And then the excess heat created from that process will be used to dry the upcoming feedstock and that will also go to power homes. So they can provide a carbon neutral heating product for residents. And, and this plugs into a district heating network. Um, and one of their machines can uh, create enough heat for a to power 182 homes. So they're capturing carbon, they're getting rid of a waste resource. And then they, they as a thank you to um, for the citizens giving their garden waste, they actually they drop off some garden waste and then they come and pick up biochar in return. And they're doing that at the moment just because they're trying to get the word out. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what they're doing now. And now they now have plans to set up uh, six of these uh, around Sweden. So they're very progressive. And this is something which we want to learn from and replicate and, and add to. So that is um, we will be putting out a blog on the Stockholm Biochar projects. We found some really good. PDFs that they've released as well as uh, an interview with them so we'll make those available on our Instagram and, and our website blog. You assume when you use garden waste it will be a mixture of um, not just woody material but also slightly softer material is that still okay for producing the biochar? Yeah so um, if it's made in these large kilns that Sweden have you can put any um, biomass in there so that's anything that's natural and has carbon in it. And there are some kilns that are even designed to take sewage sludge and turn that into biochar. 
Um, but when you're making it at a small scale in your back garden in our biochar maker, that can only really take just wood waste. Um, and that's because it's really hard to burn kind of wet and green material. But on a large scale, any form of biomass is fine. Yeah, and um, I think with the green stuff, the things that, you, that are hard to compost, we should make into biochar, but things that are easily composted, I think there's uh, definitely a place for that. Um, and just to clarify, on, on the sewage sludge point, um, there is uh, evidence to say that there could be heavy metals in, in that biochar. So um, that, that biochar won't probably be used for soil applications. That will be used for um, to be mixed into asphalt or um, used in insulation or all of these sort of non-soil applications. Um, and there's a document, actually, which you can find online. It's called 55 Uses of Biochar. And that you'll see you'll be amazed at all the different things you can do with it um just while i'm on that topic I'm, i think i'll just like list off a couple of ones that i've got here so uh, as i said it does the stuff in your fridge it regulates humidity but you can also put it in your cat litter so uh it will control odors and they've estimated that if we replace um our cat litter our global use of cat litter so if we replace 20 percent of it with biochar and we can sequester 1.6 million tonnes of CO2 each year. Um, and this is something which some of our customers are now using. And funnily enough, there's a, a customer called Concrete Gardener up in Newcastle. And they've just told us that their kitten has started behaving in a much calmer way. So their kitten was really erratic. But, and as soon as they added biochar, they've calmed down. And we, had no, we have no explanation for that whatsoever. But that's an unexpected um unexpected thing uh, and then other ways to use it in the home so my probably my favorite way to use it is in my kitchen compost bin so I'll have like a, a quite a big compost bin in where I put my veg scraps and when that gets full it can really stink and then when you empty it as well like sometimes that's not very pleasant so what I will do is I'll sprinkle a layer of biochar in the bottom I'll add a layer of food scraps and every so often I'll just cover the top of that with more biochar so what that does is the the smell is is methane and as i said it's 25 times worse as a greenhouse gas than co2 so it's really important to try and do something about that so when you put biogel on top of that it will absorb some of that methane uh, and stop it from going out um, making it a lot more pleasant and it will absorb the excess liquid as well uh, and then the benefit is is when you take that to your compost bin you've already mixed biochar into your compost and with all your other garden other garden waste um, eventually you'll have a perfect mix of bio jar and compost. Um, and there's one other thing. So with with rain uh, rainwater butts, sometimes they can get a bit stagnant, a bit smelly. And one thing that you can do is you can get a pair of old tights or something permeable like that, fill it up with bio jar, put a couple of rocks in it to weigh it down. And then that will passively filter the water and absorb excess nutrients um, just to keep it fresher. Um, and then... One other thing, so with perlite and vermiculite, biochar can do pretty much the same job, but then you get all these other benefits, including the, the carbon savings. And um, there's a really great book uh, for anyone really interested in biochar called Burn, Using Fire to Cool the Earth. It's by Albert Bates and Kathleen Draper. Um, and in that, they talk about something extremely shocking, which I didn't actually know. Um, and... So vermiculite mining causes health effects similar to asbestos. So in what once was the world's largest vermiculite mine in America, 400 people have died from asbestos-related diseases. Um, and the Environmental Protection Agency had to pay $120 million to clean up this mine. Um, so there are some potentially negative health implications from its mining. And then, of course, you have to ship that heavy product uh, around the world to your location. So if we can replace at least some of that with biochar, we can have another route for carbon sequestration and potentially uh, avoid some of those negative impacts. I was just thinking when you spoke about putting it in water, would it might, or could it work in a pond where you had too much algae, for instance? Yeah, so this is one, uh, an emerging market for biochar is blue-green algae remediation. So when you have algae, like you said, it's just too much nutrients. And you can put big sacks of it along the edges and it will just passively 
uh, draw up nutrients. And then depending on what else was in that lake, you can then use that biochar and sell it to a farmer. So this is a great thing because it has so many uses. You can buy it once and then use it two or three times. Um, there's, e there's even people suggesting that you can rent biochar to some person uh, and then pick it up from them and deliver it to the farmer or, or something like that. Yeah. And I was, I was just going to say about helping with fertilize, too many fertilizers. Um, people have started using biochar, like giant biochar tea bags in rivers um, to help absorb excess um, fertilizer and nutrients. And if you put it directly into the soil, it will stop nutrient runoff as well because um, it's very porous and like a sponge. So it's really good at stopping lots of heavy metals and also nutrients running off into our waterways. And can you have too much of it in your soil? Yes, you can, <laughs> like all things. Um, yeah, so the optimum rate of biochar application in soil is between 5 and 15%, depending on the health of your soil and the climate. If you go above that, um, the literature has shown that it starts to have negative effects. Um, I'm not sure why it causes negative effects above that, but I presume it just changes the um, ecology and the way the soil works. So we always recommend, and what we've tested as well, is an application of 10%. So that's one part biochar to nine parts soil. There is, um, we've also tried to things that require more drainage. Like People are actually growing cactuses in straight biochar. I mean, I don't necessarily recommend that, but uh, we've been trialing mixing 50-50. Um, so we'll do half biochar, half potting mix. Um, but yeah, the, the general consensus is around 10 percent. And that's that's by volume, not by weight. Um, so, yeah. OK, well, fantastic. I could probably speak to you for hours and hours because this is a fascinating subject. Um, but I realised you haven't got that long. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add before I let you go? Just on the sort of climate change side of it, because that is what initially got us into this. Um, the IPCC uh, and Project Drawdown, who are two sort of leading climate scientists uh, groups, they have actually put Biojar on a list of 76 individual solutions. So Biojar is number 55, and, and they estimate that um, it can sequester, so uh, reduce or avoid emissions, but 2.2 uh, to 4.4 billion tonnes of CO2 by 2050. Um, and to put that into context, in 2018, our yearly carbon footprint was 37 billion tonnes. So that's why there's 76 individual solutions and not just one silver bullet. So one kilogram of biochar uh, is equivalent to removing three kilograms of CO2 from the air. Um, so, yeah, that's what that's just a really exciting uh, prospect. And that's why we're really passionate about it. Hmm. Excellent. Lottie, anything else you wanted to add? Um, the only other thing I'd like to add is that if anyone's listening to this and would like to try out some biochar or a biochar maker, um, we do have a coupon code for them. Um, so if you'd like to go to our website, which is earthlybiochar.com, you can use the coupon co code Roots and All. So the same as the podcast name, just as one word in all lowercase. And that'll get you 10% off your orders. But I don't think I've got anything else. If, but I'd love people to reach out and talk to us and follow us on Instagram and ask questions. That'd be great. Well, a big thank you to Connor and Lottie for talking to us about Biochar and their brilliant new venture. And also for the handy discount code. Links to the Earthly Biochar site are in the show notes and there's a wealth of information such as how to build your own kiln, guides to all the products and a webinar that explains even more on the website. Thanks to you as well for listening. Here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about the most clever and creative of bugs. And apologies to you and Dr Ian, I gather last week I rudely invaded his segment with my outro music. I'll be going back to edit that out shortly. Thanks to everyone that let me know, always good to know that some of you are listening to the end. Take care. In habitats throughout the world, a remarkable 45,000 different species of spider have so far been discovered, and 650 of these reside in Britain. Besides their key features of having eight legs and a venomous bite, all spiders produce silk, and they use their silk for different purposes, such as creating egg sacs, traversing surfaces, and for wrapping up and storing their food. But probably the most well-known use of their silk is to create webs that are usually suspended between structures for catching their prey. 
However, not all spiders use webs for this purpose, since some make them into protective canopies for their young, whilst others lay them on the ground, where they work like trip wires to alert the spiders to danger or prey. And there's even spiders that don't make any webs, but just rely on their stealth and camouflage for ambushing their victims. But for those that do make webs, they'll follow a distinct format, ranging from orbs and sheets to lace and funnel shapes. And the web's architecture will often be so unique that it'll reveal the family or even the species of spider that created it. How these spiders instinctively build their webs, though, remains one of the fascinating enigmas of the natural world. But this innate behavioural trait has clearly become hardwired into their DNA over the hundred million years that we know from specimens within ancient amber they've been using silk to trap their prey. Spiders produce their silk from a gland inside their body and it's stored as a liquid inside their abdomen. Then, when required, the spider uses its rear legs to push the liquid out through tiny pores called spinnerets, where, as it emerges, it rapidly dries into a little silk thread. A thread that research discovered is amongst the strongest and most resilient natural fibre that's ever been found, which unbelievably is five times stronger than steel. And when it's made into a mesh, it's tough enough to stop a small bullet. It's also very elastic and incredibly lightweight. So if ways are found to mass-produce spider silk cost-effectively in the future, then our eight-legged acquaintances from the natural world may well have given us all the potential to protect our bodies with clothing that previously might only have been seen in a comic book. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk follow me on twitter roots and all facebook roots and all uk and instagram roots and all pod but please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.